not exactly the kind of thing you want to hear to the question or the query or the request. Lord, show us how to increase our faith. What's Jesus' response? Just shut up and do what you're told, basically. I always say this. A lot of times people have problems with what the Bible says because it doesn't sit right with them. It just Why couldn't Jesus be a little bit more nicer? His disciples come to him and say, Lord, we want to increase in our faith. And he says, you know, only if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you can do whatever you want. And then he says, you're unworthy servants. Just be, just be obedient. Just do your job. Do what you're told. And I'm sure as I'm saying this to you, some of you are probably feeling some angst right now um, as to why would Jesus approach the question in this manner? Why couldn't, have been, why couldn't have he been more like us in the way we would approach this? So I want to remind you again that to truly understand Scripture, you have to understand Scripture from the time that it was written, not from your perspective. Does that make sense? When you read Shakespeare, you're not trying to reinterpret Shakespeare to your liking, are you? Do you read Shakespeare? Okay, when you read Shakespeare, you didn't try to reinterpret Shakespeare to your context, did you? No, you understood whatever it was you're reading from the time that it was written, in the context that it was written. Too often when we read the Bible, uh, I think a lot of people do this. They try to understand it from where they are, and it makes no sense. The fact that Jesus answered the question or the query or the uh, request, Lord, show us how to increase our faith, and he, he, the, the perspective that he was coming from was from the first century perspective, kind of giving us an insight into the master-servant relationship. We don't have master-servant relationships today. But we're not that far away from a time in our country's history when slavery was institutional to our shame. But today, we understand texts like this from our perspective, and it makes no sense. We have to understand it from their perspective, the time that it was written, when there were relationships between masters and servants. And masters came home, told the servants what to do, and they did it without gratitude, without appreciation, without so much as an acknowledgement of the gifts and graces that they bring. Today, this is foreign to us. We want to be recognized. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be applauded and patted on the back for a job well done. That's just not how it worked. Even though you may not like the fact that Jesus is very cold about this, he was just repeating, or rather, he's just pointing to how things were in his time. And he uses that as the basis of his teaching and that metaphor applying it to faith. The message is very clear. You want to increase in your faith? Just do what I tell you to do. Do what I have commanded you to do. That's how you will increase your faith. But talking about increasing our faith, yeah, let's talk about that. Is that even a thing anymore? When's the last time you went into coffee hour and sat with people around the table and said, you know, if there's one thing that I would really, really like, I would really like to increase my faith. When's the last time you sent an email to a friend or a pen pal or whatever? You know, if there's one thing that I could really, really improve in my life, increase in my life, it would be faith. Anyone? No, I mean, who talks about that? 
who talks about increasing their faith. In a society that's constantly moving away from religion, you understand that, right? You realize that. We live in a society that we call a postmodern society that's moving away from religious expression. And we're looking for more practical, uh, scientific, if you will, expressions of reality. So we live in this time <clears throat> where we are moving away from religion. In our culture, people are not looking for faith. They're certainly not looking to increase their faith. So it's hard enough to get people to come to church. How can we even have a conversation about increasing our faith? So this is a conversation that's pretty much limited to people who are already in church. It's really pointing to a deeper issue of the nature of the church today. What would increasing faith do? What does it mean to increase our faith? How do we increase our faith? And what are the ramifications and the consequences of doing so? Looking at our culture today, let me ask you a question. Generally speaking, when we talk about increasing something in our lives, what are we talking about? I'm sorry? Money. We want to increase in what? Increase our wealth. What else? Well, yeah, that's part of wealth. What else do we want to seek to increase? What's all the political rhetoric about? Increasing our... Did you guys all watch the debates? What is that an example of a display of what? Power. Yeah? We want to increase control and influence. When we, in our culture, in other words, in our society in general, when we talk about increasing anything, we're talking about increasing our wealth, our fame, our power, our influence, and on and on and on. And what I'm proposing to you is that in our faith, we practice similar ethics. Why would, why would we need to increase our uh, wealth? What's the reason behind that? Security. Who does it benefit primarily? Don't be shy, just yell it out. The self. When we talk about increasing our power in, the terms, of, in terms of military power, who, who are we talking about here? Who does it benefit most? Ourself. Influence ourself. And on and on and on. I think we take the same approach when we're talking about faith, increasing our faith in the, uh, in the general culture of the church. We're really talking about how it benefits us. To be more specific, how, it, how I can benefit by increasing my faith. Last week, I alluded to a conversation that I had with Tony Campolo and he called it the boring gospel. A gospel that only serves us. I am saved by the blood of the Lamb, and I am going to heaven, and I'm good. Period. Are you saved? Are you a Christian just because that affords you a way to get to heaven? Is that why faith matters to you? And if that's the case... We call that the boring gospel. But the living gospel, as we saw, talked about last week, is different. Personal spirituality and personal salvation is an embodiment of a consumer ethic. How do you stand to benefit? What do you stand to gain? What is in it for you? But the living gospel is entirely, entirely different. There's so much more to being a disciple than just going to heaven. Amen? There is so much more to being a disciple than just being saved. Amen? Increasing our faith 
is important, yes. But there is something more important than increasing our faith. So let me ask you, okay? Fill in the blanks. If increasing our faith is about our filling our own needs, what, how would you characterize filling others' needs? Increasing what? If increasing our faith is about filling our own needs, what would we do, increase in what area to fill others' needs? Relationships. Increase in our relationships. The way I would, the way, the word, I want to give you a word today. It's not a new word. I didn't make it up. Um, the word is vitality. Increasing in vitality. Another word for that would be relevance. Meaning and purpose. Instead of increasing or focusing on increasing our faith, what we need to increase is our vitality and our relevance. And I'm proposing to you that the increase in our faith happens as a natural byproduct of living with vitality and relevance and meaning and purpose. Amen. Do you understand that? You know, I think the saddest thing that I've ever seen in my life, in my own personal life, was witnessing my father slowly wither away till he passed last year. But the withering away was not just physical. It had to do with vitality. My father retired from ministry in 2003. He went from one day being a man of purpose and meaning and vitality to next day having little or nothing to do. When a person loses their reason for being, we all know what the inevitable outcome will be. That was one of the most heartbreaking things that I personally witnessed in my life, in my short life of 25 years. When a person or a church loses its purpose and meaning, i.e. vitality. We know what's going to happen. Increasing in vitality is where our hearts and our minds must be. Not focusing on increasing our faith as much, because as I just said, faith is a natural byproduct of vitality and meaning and purpose. Last week I talked about signs of life and signs of death. Do you remember? In the first service I asked people and I drew nothing but crickets. So let's see what your uh, power of recollection is and, and, and help me, you know, not kill you. What is the sign of life? When, when things are growing, 
When things are expanding, we call that what? Starts with P. Huh? Progress? No. No, not power. Proliferation. Life is characterized by proliferating. Things are growing. When there's so much life, like Dante, for example, he's a six-year-old kid. He has boundless energy. Where is it coming from? I don't know. Stop feeding him. Maybe he'll slow down. But this boundless energy has to be expended. And if you give him a hammer and nail, you know, <laughs> don't give him a hammer and nail. Uh, but life is characterized by growth, expansion, proliferation. What is death characterized by? Saint, let's stick with the letter P. Preservation. What happens when you step out into the cold and in really extreme cold? You know why your hands get so cold in the winter? Does, does that happen to you? You know what's happening there when you go out into the cold? Yeah, the blood flow is not getting there. Why? Yeah, your body is trying to protect the core. Keep your heart and your brain and your lungs going. You don't need fingers to survive, although they're nice. You don't need them to survive. Your body goes into preservation mode when you're dying. You understand that? The purpose of increasing our faith, and remember I asked you a question, what would we need to increase our faith for? Is to proliferate. And to proliferate, we need to focus not on increasing our faith, but increasing our vitality, increasing our meaning, understanding rather of our meaning and purpose. Here's what I'm talking about. Tony mentioned this too a couple of weeks ago. Years and years ago when people were living in rural communities, when there was a poor family or sick family or people in need, guess who stepped up to the plate? The church. About 150, 180 years ago, this country went through what we call the Industrial Revolution. And jobs that paid a lot more than a season of farming were being handed out in urban areas, in factories, so what did people do? They sold their land, they sold their farms, sold their homes, and moved their families into urban areas where a population explosion occurred in our major cities. And it became too much for a single church or a single organization to care for everybody. So guess what happened? The government the government took over. What do you think the churches said after that? Okay, thanks. Well, I guess then our job is done. In effect, the churches lost their reason for existence. Churches lost their meaning and purpose. And since then, we've seen a steady decline in the vitality of the church over the last 150 years or so. To now, in the postmodern culture here today, we live in a culture and a society where people are moving away from religion. Because they don't see the need for it. What does that tell you? What is the need that the church met? What is the need that the church fulfilled? Answering scientific questions? No. What is it? Feeding the hungry. Clothing the naked. Giving shelter to the homeless. Providing for people in need. That was the church's function. That was the church's role. And now that's been taken away, 
in many cases, happily given away, what is the church's reason for existence now? So increasing our faith is not the right question here. How do we increase our vitality? What meaning and what purpose do we connect with? That's the question. So we focus so much on increasing our wealth, increasing our power, increasing our influence, increasing control. So let's say where, you, where we are in this country, I mean, we gathered so much stuff, we accumulated so much wealth and power. What good is all of that if we're not doing anything with it? What good is it if we're not doing anything with it? What good is it if you get an education if you don't do anything with it? What good is it if you increase your faith? What if you don't do anything with it? What's the point? What is the point? For years and years, as a response to the Industrial Revolution, the Christian church has done so much work in trying to increase our church numbers. Increasing in size. So we talk about evangelism and we talk about going door to door and knocking on people's door and asking them if they know Jesus. Going on the streets with the four spiritual law pamphlet and trying to convert people on the streets to increase our size. But what's the point of being the largest church in town if you're not transforming lives? if you're not changing people's lives, what point is there in doing and being that kind of a church? What I see today is now that we are in full preservation mode, churches are in full preservation mode. What I see now is churches asking these questions. First, how the heck did this happen? (laughs) Two, what do we do to get out of it? And the answer is very simple. Look in the Gospels, the living gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of salvation from poverty, from oppression, from captivity, from blindness, and I don't mean literal blindness, although that could be part of it, but from the blindness of the mind and the heart. If you look in the Gospels, Jesus hits this home again and again and again and again. If you live around this area, how many of you live around this area? Every morning for the last year, all I heard every morning was, have you heard that? You know what that is? Yeah. Jersey Shore Medical Center is building this new building of hope. Wow. What a great name for a building, building of hope. But can you do it with a little less noise? (laughs) I love hope and everything. I love hope as much as the next guy, but can you just quiet down a little bit as you do it? You know what they're doing, right? They're driving, um, I don't know what they call it, pylons? Yeah, into the ground so they can construct a building, erect a building on top of that. It's like that. If you open the Gospels, you're going to hear That's all you're going to hear. You know what that sound is? That's Jesus saying That's Jesus. <laughs> you know what's coming, right? If you don't want to hear it just go like this. That's Jesus saying 
a disciple's role is to obey what I command them to do. To do. Love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and do unto others. Again, doing unto others is not, I'm not going to hit George because I don't want him to hit me back. That's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Doing unto others as Jesus meant it is, if I was the one who was hungry, if I was the one who was thirsty, if I was the one who was naked and out in the cold, and if I was the one who was homeless and desperate and destitute, what would I want George to do for me? Therefore, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's vitality. We do that, and we will live. Amen. Vitality, relevance, meaning, purpose, loving your God, loving your neighbor, and doing unto others. A month ago, I talked about spiritual disciplines, the spiritual discipline of prayer, of scripture reading, of fasting, of going to church and worshiping. And what's the fifth one? I said prayer. Service. The spiritual discipline of service. Jesus didn't really talk about prayer. Jesus didn't talk about that. He didn't teach his disciples a lot of, an awful lot about prayer. He didn't teach his disciples about fasting. He didn't teach them about worship. He didn't even tell them to read scripture because they were all illiterate. What he taught them over and over and over again. <laughs> the spiritual discipline of service. All the other spiritual disciplines can combined cannot equal one single act of service. What does it matter if you pray all day if you're not going to do anything? What does it matter if you come to worship every week, even if it's twice, three times a week, if you don't do anything to help others? What does it matter if you fast, if you don't do anything? None of it matters without service. Jesus is very clear about this point. If you really want to increase your faith, you must increase your vitality. Do what the master commands. This is the only way. And he said this further. He said, you don't go out and do works of compassion and mercy and grace and love because they need it. You do it because you need it. You do it because you will benefit from it. Amen. Yeah, say amen. Why do we ignore that and continue to seek these other methods of increasing our faith? Watching a televangelist, I hate to break it to you, watching a televangelist is not going to increase your faith. You can watch them all not going to increase your faith. One single act of compassion and mercy, that will increase not only your faith, but first increase your vitality, your meaning and purpose for why you're here. You want to increase your faith? Love God, love your neighbor, and do unto others. Increase in vitality.